let's let's go back into a little bit more detail if we can. Okay. Yeah. So let's start with this slide. This is uh, basically just a, a, a PowerPoint picture of what I was just drawing on the whiteboard here. Um, and so you here you see we have this feed forward input it says FF input from sensory. It's going to layer four. That's where it terminates. That's classic neuroscience. Um, layer four. This is in the green arrows. Layer four projects to layer two three. That's our and. Layer 2-3 is an output layer. That is literally the cells in layer 2-3 project elsewhere in the cortex. So you have a two-layer input layer and output layer. This is well known. This is nothing speculative about this at all. Mm -hmm. um, also, layer 2-3 projects long distances. We'll talk about that in a moment. And it projects back to layer 2. I'm not showing here the temporal memory layer again. Remember I said earlier, I'm just going to talk about um, the new model. We're right. not going to show the temporal memory. So we're just showing layer 4. And we see layer 2-3. We're kind of ignoring the lower layers. We, um, 3B. 3B. Okay. So that's the basic model. It's a two layer input. There's an input layer, there's an output layer. This is well established neuroscience. It turns out, um, just to get make things a little bit more complicated, I'm a, sorry, but that's the way it is. Um, this same motif, if you will, appears twice in every region. Mm -hmm. The same input that goes to layer four goes to layer 6A. It forms the same types of representation, spatial pool or mini columns, all that stuff. That projects to layer five, and layer five is an output layer. Um, and, uh, and layer five projects long distances, and layer five projects back. So this, this two-layer circuit we've come up with, we understand pretty well now, uh, appears twice. And we're not going to get into too much speculation why that is. We're working on that. We don't quite know. Well, we have some big clues, but we don't know. Right. Uh, so we got some hypotheses. We have some, a lot of evidence to sift through. Um, it's not like, oh my gosh, we have no idea. It's just like, well, this is possible, it's all possible. So if you actually were to then look at this third slide here, you'd see that um, this thing is repeated twice. Now, with the new thing, which we were just talking about, is this orange line. The allocentric. And I labeled it there, location allocentric. That comes from someplace else. And, and we'll talk about it in a second. You asked the question mm -hmm. in there. Um, and you see it actually it comes in and it initially projects to layer six. Mm -hmm. That's what we want, right? Because we're going to model the allocentric position in both these things. Layer 6A, uh, that's where it goes. And then, um, and then layer 6A becomes the input to layer four. So the al actual allocentric input to layer four is coming from layer 6A. So I kind of missed what's going on in layer six? Uh, we haven't, we're not talking about that. You, okay. I, I'm giving you circuitry mm -hmm. and plumbing here, okay? These, yeah. are, these are physical facts. Okay. Uh, and what we have said is that the distal inputs on the input layer are going to be allocentric location. Right. And, I, and some of the and some of these ideas, like we don't know exactly how some of it works, but we know what it's doing, right? And some uh, of it's some of, yeah, it's, you have to be careful. We understand a lot. There's some things we don't understand. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, no, I wouldn't normally want to, the circuits. We understand this two layer circuit really well. We, we don't understand exactly why it's twice. We don't understand exactly all the transformations on. So I'm just giving you the, 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 the facts. Right. And then we're going to come back for a moment. Okay. You Originally, you asked, where did the allocentric location come from? Yes. And the main thing here is it's coming from elsewhere. It's not coming from this region itself. Mm -hmm. It's coming from where? Someplace else. Where is that? Let's, let's go look at another diagram here. Um, this diagram. This has two pictures. Um, and now I have to introduce this idea. I have to show, I'll talk about something else that's well known in neuroscience. Is that whenever you have a region in a sensory, or sensory region, like the region that gets input from the eyes, the region that gets input from the skin, mm -hmm. from, from your ears, there's always a, a complementary region. There's two of them, actually. Uh, and they're, sometimes they go by the term what and where. There's a what region and a where region. But in the same space of cells? There are, no, cells? two separate two. regions. Okay. Imagine we think about a hierarchy of yeah. going up, you know, the region, 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 the hierarchy. Mm -hmm. Well, there's actually two parallel hierarchies, mm -hmm. region, region, region. Uh, and one's called, this was first discovered in vision. So um, in vision, it's the ventral and the dorsal stream. But the term, the term what and where is sort of nice about it. Mm -hmm. So there seems to be this. Excuse me, there's two parallel vision streams, and there's two parallel auditory streams, and there's two parallel somatosensory or touch streams. Mm -hmm. um, what and where, okay? And let's talk about vision first. Okay. Because in vision was where it was first discovered. They said, wow, look, there's these two separate visual systems going on. What's the difference between them? Well, the reason they say one is called what is because um, that seems to represent objects in the world. The, the what is out there. And the where seems to sort of be something they say sort of represents where it is. Right. So it turns out 
one is an egocentric and one's an allocentric representation. Okay. So let's take the allocentric representation, which would be classic V1 and V2 and V4. This is what? This is the what one. If I have, I'm, I'm looking at an object and I take and I say, okay, I'm going to damage the what pathway. I'm going to damage V2 or something like that. So what do I know? I, as a person, I would say, oh, I see there's something there. I know what it is. I know, I know where, where it is, is in reference to myself. myself. I can go out and reach it, but I can't tell you what it is. Uh -huh. The what's gone. Right. This is a very it's fascinating. It's almost like you cannot recall what it is. It, it's that you see it, but you just have no idea what it is. It's like it's something. I can't tell you what it is. Yeah, and I'll say, can you even reach as it? you're touching? Well, as that's, you're well, let's not to get there because if I, if my, I'm just on my vision right now. Okay. But I can say, well, I don't know what's there, but I can go out and reach it and I grab it, and you can do it really well. So it's like, oh yeah, that's surprising. <laughs> um, if you damage the other side, the wear pathway, then I look at, oh, there's a coffee cup. I know. Or there's a pen. There's whatever. There's Mac. Mm -hmm. But I can't reach it. I said, I don't, I don't know how to get to it. I'm looking at it. I, I see it. I know what it is, but I can't actually get to it. You can't act upon it. You can't act it because yeah. the egocentric representation is lost. I don't know where it is relative to me, but I can know what it is. Yeah. And the other side is I, I know where it is relative to me, but I can't see what it is. Right. So these, this is a common theme throughout the neocortex. So when we're talking about uh, this structure and an allocentric location, are we just talking about one of those hierarchies? Just the, Yeah, one region. What, uh, uh, well, I'm talking about, we're just talking here. We developed this thinking about touch, but it would apply to vision or hearing as well. So when when I'm talking right now, just take a classic V1 or S1. These are the primary sensory cortex for vision and touch. And we're saying, how does that work? And, and if we're talking about that, that's a what pathway. Right. Um, I need to get an allocentric location. Now, where is the allocentric location coming from? Right. All right. Let's go back and look at this slide here. Okay. okay. This is some more anatomy that's basically known. Um, it's a little sketchy in some parts of the literature. But there are, um, because we have these two parallel pathways, um, what we think is going on is, um, and these signals exist, we think that there's a communication between the what and the where. It's basically providing this information. Uh, between these two hierarchies. Between the equivalent regions in the hierarchy. Right. So if I talk about um, uh, somatosensory, there's a motor cortex, M1, and it's, it's more complicated than this, but there's, let's say there's M1 and S1, so there's the motor cortex and there's the mass center cortex. Mm -hmm. they're, they are like where and what, um, and they connect to each other. Now, why would you want to do this? Because when, if I'm about to move relative to something, let's say I have my coffee cup, and I'm going to move my hand or my finger relative to it. Well, I'm just going to move my hand or my finger. I'm just going to move my finger. So I'm going to move my finger down. Mm -hmm. I want to be able to predict what I'm going to feel. Yeah. So I've said, move my finger down, what am I going to feel? Well, the movement down is a movement relative to my body. So that's a, the movements initially start out as it's an egocentric movement. That's how movements are. Yeah. Where it's going to land on the coffee cup depends on where the coffee cup is and its orientation at any point in time. Right. So I can't just say a movement down takes me to the bottom of the coffee cup because it maybe it doesn't. Maybe it takes yeah. to the side of the coffee cup. You need both. Well, you need to know what your motor behavior was. And you have to convert it into an equivalent allocentric. So I have to start with an egocentric representation of behavior, right. which is where behavior starts. And I have to convert it into a new allocentric location on so the object. So you know potential. what to expect. So, I, so that I can apply to my model of the coffee cup and right. know what to expect. So every object that you're looking at, you've got these dual representations of you and your relation to it versus it yeah. and its representation. What's become self. clear to us is that the cortex is infused with this everywhere. Yeah, it's everywhere. Is these these conversions between reference frames going on all the time? All the senses. All everywhere. the senses. It's everywhere. Yeah. So um, in this diagram here, it's worth pointing out. I show this is more of a conceptual diagram. All these these uh, the basic circuitry exists. Mm -hmm. The upper one, we're saying, hey, when the body moves, it generates a behavior in M one. Um, that has to generate a signal, which gets passed over to the, the sensory cortex mm -hmm. and becomes an allocentric location. Right, because uh, you yeah. have to know where you're going. To well, where am I going to be on the object after I move to make right. a prediction of what I'm going to feel? Yeah. Right. I have to know if I'm going to touch this microphone uh, and move my finger, I have a different expectation if I'm touching this and move my finger, and I have sure. a different expectation of their orientation. I have to know what object I'm touching, I have to know its orientation and position relative to my body, and once I do all that, I can make a prediction. Right. But these have to happen because you're making predictions all the time. Yeah. 
So there's a there's some there's a process here for how this gets converted from a behavior into an allocentric location. Mm -hmm. We have some theories about that. We have some models of that. We're not exactly certain exactly where it's occurring in all the different layers. So we're, I'm not going to go deeper into that. Okay. But we has to occur. Yeah. The other thing is it has to go backwards the other way. And why is that? It's because let's say I'm manipulating something like this pen, and I say to myself, okay, I want to touch the top of the pen. Mm -hmm. Well, what is, oh, you have to translate uh, what is the movement I have to make to create to touch the top of the pen? Yeah. Well, it depends on the orientation of the pen. Yeah. If the pen's like this, I have to move my hand up. If the pen's like this, I have to move my hand to the left. So it depends on the pen's allocentric location, how you egocentric. It, it depends on the it. pen's orientation. Orientation. Right. So I can say I have a movement I want to make relative to the pen. Of course, you do this all the time, right? Yeah. It, it's kind of, you're not even aware of this. Yeah. Um, so I say, I have a movement I want to create in allocentric coordinates. Mm -hmm. I have to send it back to the motor cortex, convert it into an egocentric movement. Ah, so you can act. So, so, yeah. so this communication has to go both ways. Right. Um, you have to take movements and say, what is the new location on the object? And you have to say, I want to do something to the object. What is the movement I have to do to create that? So in these, maybe I can uh, expand on this, because in these two different sort of hierarchical Structures the what and the where pathways. The, the, however, these the, are. Yeah, I wouldn't draw them like that. I would, you want to, I would why draw don't you like draw them? Like, then? So if you draw like this, you say you draw a little hierarchy like this, and you have another little hierarchy like this. Yeah, there we go. So what versus so where? This is going up and uh -huh. down, and this is going up and down, and what we're saying is a back and forth between them. And it's sort of like that, which is the right. which is converting the locations. Right. Uh -huh. So they're they're cooperating all throughout yes. each other, yeah. so that yeah. they can. Understand yeah. space and time essentially. Well, yeah. There's, uh, the more you think about this, the more you come to realize that this is that everything you perceive in the world is at some location in space, and therefore uh, everything has to have this allocentric location associated. Yeah. Uh, it's a it's a pretty. I mean, in some sense, it would be some scientists say oh, that's obvious, um, and it kind of is obvious. You can deduce it. Mm -hmm. But on the other hand, uh, it, a detailed model that this is occurring in all sensory regions of the cortex is novel. And uh, as far as we know, no one even thinks the cortex does anything, like V1 does anything any close to the sophisticated. Because mm -hmm. what we can now show is that a, even a primary sensory region, S1 or V1, can learn the, the entire structure of 3D objects. And most people think it's just extracting some feature and passing it on to someone else. I see. Um, so it's far more powerful than it used to be. Anyway, so this is the drawing we've got. You've got these, a, what, a where region, and a what hierarchy, and a what hierarchy. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one's working in allocentric, one's working in egocentric, one's generating you know, behaviors in allocentric space, one's generating behaviors in egocentric space, and they have to convert back and forth between these two coordinate frames. Now let's assume this is maybe V1, for example. Well, v vision, v1, 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 this might be V1, this would be MT, something like that. Okay, but uh, the vision processing. Yeah. And so if there's other, if there's somatosensory processing or audio processing, are those communicating with each other the same? Uh, well, they would have similar hierarchies. This drawing I picked here is of sort of a, um, a Conceptual drawing, a yeah. schematic. But I mean, does your vision help your your? At some point, sure. Processing? At some point, there, there's um, got to be some lateral connections uh, here. As yeah, well, it, this goes back to an idea that actually I, I wrote about it on intelligence. Um, is that if you think about um, you think about your sensory organs, you've got your retina, and you got your skin, and you got your cochlea. These are all just two dimensional or you know, flat arrays of sensory bits. Yeah. Right? yeah. I mean, your skin is a million bits of and your retina is about a million, your two retinas. Um, and so the way to think about this is the brain handles them all the same, mm -hmm. pretty much, you know, roughly. And, um, and your, your, imagine your retina is so big, you have a million fibers on it, you can't process it all at once. So the most you can handle is a small section at any point in time. You can model an input coming from a small section. So, so you can't, in one region, process the entire visual input. Sure. So you have to have another region which sort of takes the output of the first region and so on, and you, and you sort of build up. Well, the parts of the retina are no different. You know, like different. The left side of the retina and the right side of the retina can't communicate with each other in the first layer in the hierarchy. They're just too far apart. There's too much information between them. You follow that? Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Well, it's no different than saying parts of the retina and parts of my skin are too far apart. And so there's a convergence as you go up the hierarchy. There's a convergence that occurs. Cells, you know, converge as they go up, and there's no difference between convergence between different parts of the retina and different between vision and auditory. Sure. Uh, or somatic. I mean, you have to have something that's coordinating the input. From you know, but it doesn't have to be coordinated. It, no. It, it, um, Predicting, understanding. Uh, it's natural. 
we're getting a little bit far afield here. I don't believe there is, I mean, obviously, it, you can't just wire them up willy nilly. Sure. There is a convergence that occurs, but there is nothing that says, okay, I'm processing vision in auditory now. But what I'm talking about is I see a Jaguar, I hear a Jaguar, I know it's a Jaguar. It's something Actually, what we're saying, than... we're, no, we're saying the following, you're missing the point of okay, that. Okay, that's okay. We're saying in the new theory, I can see a Jaguar and know it's a Jaguar, even in this first region of the cortex, as long as the Jaguar doesn't occupy too much of my visual space. I see. We're saying that each region is actually learning the, the entire three-dimensional representation of objects within what they can see. Right. So if I can see a part of my visual space, I can represent solid 3D objects in that visual space. I don't need to pass it to someone else the same as a Jaguar. And this is the important thing here is this is something that before we might have assumed we needed a higher yes. construction. Yes, everyone else does. Right. Yeah. There's evidence, by the way, uh, we've now discovered evidence of something called border, border ownership, um, which some scientists have found, which is showing exactly what I'm saying, that the, even V1 can recognize complex objects that are bigger than you think that they can. Without uh, hierarchy. Without hierarchy. Within a layer. Within a region. A, 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 or a level in the hierarchy. So um, so the way to think about this is the following. You, you've, got some, you've got some large layer of cells. This is, of course, like a sheet. It's, I'm just drawing it as one-dimensional. It's two-dimensional. Sure. Um, and it's getting this input from something. We don't really, it doesn't really care what the input's coming from. Mm -hmm. um, it's going to able, it's able to, within some region of this thing, it's going to be able to model 3D objects. Um, that it, in some part of the input space. Mm -hmm. if, the, if the object is larger than this, this one region can't do that. They have to cooperate. Well, it just, it, it, it basically, I, I can't, it just, I have to have another level in the hierarchy to do that. Right. Um, so, but the mechanism is occurring, the same exact mechanism is occurring everywhere, that a single region can learn the three-dimensional structure of an object given some extent of input space. Okay. It doesn't matter if that's vision or touch or whatever, it doesn't make no difference. Um, but it might only represent a portion of an object. Or, or. Uh, if, if it's all within here, it can represent the entire object. Right. So here's one way to think about it. I'm, I'm very confident now to say that when I read, um, and, I, and letters are small enough that, and words are small enough that they fit within a certain dimension of my V1 or my retina, uh -huh. I can recognize the entire word right in V1. Right. That's, okay. a, that's a bold statement. Most people would think that's crazy. Yeah. But I'm telling you, that's what's going on. But if that word was bigger, Mm -hmm. Or it was, it was a sentence or something was stronger. It's more than, complex. It was just more, longer, literally physically bigger, not okay. more complex, just bigger. To the, in the, in the retina space. Just to the retina space. Yes, it's yeah. occupying more of the retina. And yeah. so and it goes beyond what I can process in my first layer. Sure. That yeah. Physically just it, extends beyond it. The input is larger. Yeah, right. the input is larger. Then I can't do it all in one. In one in, I have to go up the hierarchy to, to right. do that. I have to get some convergence. Um, huh. Just to recognize the word, not the meaning of the word. Well, no, well, well, let's not go there. Okay, right. just to recognize the word. I mean, to recognize the word is to recognize the meaning of it. So, huh. um, but just to say, to say, recognize the word. Okay. Uh, let's let's go there. There is no, there's no other place in the brain that says, oh, the meaning of something. It's, okay. Uh, um, so we're getting a little bit far afield here. Uh, we haven't even talked about what we've actually accomplished in this new theory. Um, we're, just, we're giving some background. This is all about background in the brain, about where this theory fits and how it, um, where does it belong. It belongs, we're talking about a theory of, of a two-layer input-output model that occurs twice in each region. Every region has them, both wet regions and wear regions, with these two hierarchies going on. The whole model would be relying on the fact that uh, I have an allocentric location and, and I can convert between allocentric and ecocentric, and that's going on between the wet and the wear regions. Uh, but in the end, we have a two-layer model that says how this works, and we should talk about that briefly. Let's do that. That's the that's the that's the thing we discovered.